Okay, we're ready to start. I just want to introduce our next speaker, uh, Fran Cassidy, and to say I'm so delighted she's here. The IPA are the organization, probably anywhere in the world, that's closest from a uh, focus on accountability, market accountability, to what MASP is on. So we are thrilled you know, to start bringing the two organizations together. To cooperate. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Joanna. Well, I'm thrilled to be here. I'm thrilled to have uh, beaten the storms to get here because it was about a 50 50 chance that the flight would have been cancelled yesterday. But uh, but now I'm absolutely delighted to be here. Um, as uh, Joanna said, I work with an, a number of organisations. I've been a marketing director, I've worked in an agency, and I've worked with media owners. So I do work across a lot of those things. But for the last eight years or so, one of my clients has been the IPA, and I've been Delighted to work with them on their um, their effectiveness work, but just so that we know a little bit more about about what they do, it's the Institute of Practitioners in Advertising. It represents the advertising uh, agency uh, media agency body. It's the professional industry body. It has around three hundred members, and it covers all ranges from agencies from creative, integrated, digital, as much as there are at the moment, and media, obviously. And the objective is. To obviously to enable the, the member agencies to uh, to be more successful and more profitable, they've got three pillars, three core pillars to what they do. There's an effectiveness pillar, a commercial pillar, and talent pillar. The effectiveness pillar and the work that I'm going to talk about fits under that. Is really about creating a value for for, for clients uh, and delivering that. The commercial pillar is a uh, commercial pillar is how they can. Um, actually make more money and do business better. And the talent pillar, increasingly important, is how can we get better people into the industry um, and, and, and to get them to stay there. So the effectiveness pillar has been going for about 10 years now. And in, in, in essence, it's about trying to increase the amount of evidence-based decisions that are made in market. And they do that by creating resources and insight and tools to help the industry, not just the agency body, but all the marketers and brand owners as well and everybody else in between. And as I said, it's been going for about 10 years. And these are a few of the reports that you may have seen, you may have come across, all of which are available uh, now. Um, and one of the reasons that they've been able to do all this is because they have a data bank of 44 years of effectiveness data from their effectiveness awards process. And with, when everybody actually puts in an, uh, an effectiveness award, they have to fill in a huge um, uh, sort of spreadsheet, a questionnaire about all the elements of that campaign. And we've got 44 years of that. So what that means is that we can say what's happened to the last 10 years to the previous 30 years, what's happened to the last five years, what makes a great effective campaign. And as a result of that, we have one of these, these reports. I'd say probably the most famous um, is the long and the short of it, which was produced about 10 years ago. And if you've heard of Peter Field and Les Binet, that's one of their major reports. Still um, referred to regularly right now. So it's still up. It's still being referred to regularly. Absolutely. Right yeah. We we are in, in the last year actually we had a conference and we did a session with them of ten years of the long and short of it. What have we learned? Where have we gone from it? it was absolutely amazing. You can look at it online and you can watch it. Um, the two most recent ones are these two that we did last year in the report. I'm the, the study that I'm going to talk about is in this in this report. I would say. Of all of this, probably the most famous chart that has been produced in the last 10 years has been this one. It's one of the most famous charts that the IPA have ever produced via Peter and Les. And it's called the Sawtooth Chart. And what it demonstrated was essentially that you need both long and short term um, activations to make a, make, a brand, make a brand work, but also how, how they work is different. And obviously, I don't, know, I don't know how many of you have seen this before, but it, in essence, it, it basically says that brand building takes a longer time and short term falls away very, very quickly. Um, so if you keep measuring your activity here, you will never see any return from your brand. Now, incidentally, 
there was a the work about 18 months ago by ISBAR, which was the Anthony equivalent of the ANA here, and 58% of clients in the UK were doing measurement at that point. Only. Nothing else. And we wonder why we've got a short-term problem. And we wonder why marketing isn't perceived to be working. And that's one of the reasons why. Yeah. Okay. Uh, just, I'm curious to know whether this is in, in the wheelhouse of the work that you've done, uh, but have you got a look at the residual effect of turning off long-term brand building because that's what's also thrown a lot yes. of people off. Yes. They're attributing performance to short-term oh, effects, yeah. but it's actually the slow decline yeah. of the long-term build-up. Like, I'm just curious to know, is there anything around that that you publish? Uh, not in not in a, um, in a, in a, a group of, of activity. I would okay. say we have plenty of cases yeah. where that has been turned off and then it's come back on again, and how long it's taken to come back. We've got lots of examples of uh, of where changes in strategy have uh, have had an effectiveness. Like, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think probably the uh, very fast, so 2018 is probably the best one on that. We've been roughly 200 CPG cases where yeah. advertising has been turned off. Yeah. Back to 10 years, that was the advertising going off. I think the other great thing about this chart is that it is probably been the, the, the founder of so many aha moments where people that haven't really understood how advertising worked or haven't really understood how marketing works suddenly get it and how, why they need to do both. And so it's been, it's been a great, a great, great help. So, um, so this marketing investment report we produced last year. I suppose one of the questions is, why would the IPA start investing in understanding how investment analysts understand marketing and advertising? Well, certainly they are at the pointy end, the sharp end of really stating whether a company is performing or not. And, and so their view on whether an, a, a, a company is performing or not is really important their view of how marketing can contribute to that is also incredibly important. So we undertook with Brand Finance and, and a lady called Annie Brown, who I work with on this on study, to understand what they knew about marketing and advertising, whether they thought it had any value, whether principally it was a cost or an investment, um, what financial metrics it actually affected, um, and what their attitude was to shifting in terms of financial accountability, marketing investment from OPEX, uh, from OPEX to CAPEX. What do they think about that as an idea? And then we produced a, a report, which we also asked a, a former analyst, Ian Whitaker, to, to sort of amplify for us and produce this report. So one of the first, oh, I should say, we've got 100 UK analysts and 100 US analysts, and they covered a huge range of sectors, everything from mining to technology to FMCG to retail to everything. Um, I can, and I will show you some um, splits between B2C analysts and B2B analysts, because that does actually create a bit of a difference sometimes. So first, one of the first questions was, what is the significance of the non-financial measures that they, that they look at? How important were they? Now, one of the things I forgot to mention was that the last time the IPA did anything on the investment analysts um, was back in 2005. And it was a UK only study. It was relatively small, but we took some of the questions that we asked in 2005 and asked them again now to see what the trends were. And as you can see here, there's a huge, significantly dif a significant difference in what they're looking at now in the non-financial measures side compared to what they looked at in 2005. And it's not really that surprising when you think about it, because something, you know, Brand Finance have been producing something called the Gift Report, which looks at intangibles over time which is included in that non-financial measures. And this is the rise of intangibles basically since 1996. In fact, the IPA helped to launch this, uh, this study back in, uh, in 1996. And you can see the rise of that. And it, it reached a peak in, uh, in 2020. 
uh, of 75 trillion. Um, it dropped again in 2022, and then it's gone back up again. So it is continuing, continuing to rise. In fact, the the uh, the importance of intangibles in overall um, uh, in overall company analysis was one of the reasons that we wanted to find out what investment analysts thought about marketing and their contribution to all of this. Because I think marketing, um, uh, sorry, brand finance. Think of a, they think they. I think you um, have suggested that within the intangibles asset base, marketing and brand is often around 30 to 35% of that. So if you think of that, and you think of that rise, then the intangibles and the value of marketing within the performance of organizations will be a lot bigger. I'd like to yeah. add to this. Um, I, I have um, author Asif years ago where we did an inflation adjusted calculation. Ah. And on an inflation adjusted basis, tangible assets as a share, tangible, so not so tangible. Yeah, tangible. tangible assets yeah. on an inflation adjusted basis as a share of corporate value have had a negative value yeah. since the 1970s. Yeah. So each year they're declining as drivers of overall enterprise value. Wow. So so this is going and showing like intangible versus disclosed. Yes. And their dependency is increasing year over year. So it's uh, so on, on an inflation adjusted basis. That's brilliant. The the um the professor of economics at um uh Imperial Business School uh, has written a book. He's also an advisor to the Bank of England, and he's he's got he's gone on record to say essentially that the accounting system we have now is not fit for purpose because of this. And and there is a swell of opinion and a movement now to start to sh begin the conversation again to shift marketing into um, into uh, into capex. So, well, one more question. Yes. What, what was the sample? This will come from the base. What this one? Yeah. You'll have to ask Rabbi Bernard. That's what global. It? This that's is the sorry. This is global. Publicly traded companies. Yes. Trillions of dollars. Yeah, every single publicly traded global uh, company. Yeah, not every most. I think it's, yeah. I think it's almost all the way. I think it's 30, almost all of Thirty thousand public happy, companies. I'm happy to send you the report. Yeah. That would be yeah. great. Yeah. I mean, it is quite U.S. specific. In it, so it's U.S. biased on the value share. Be, on the because yeah. of because of the right. The, the and when titans. you look at the top ones, you'll see that it's mostly U.S. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay, so one of the one of the first questions we then asked was, you know, thinking about the the, the industries that you cover, what factors, what are the following facts do you think are important? Um, and a, a pretty extraordinary fact is that the strength of brand and marketing came out top of all the factors that we included, including leadership quality, including technology innovation, profit, and ESG. So the strength of brand and marketing came out as very important in their um, in, in their appraisal. Now, how they measure that is something else that we can talk about. But one of the things that they do do is look at A and P, which they and I've used A and P and we've used A and P in the uh, in the research only because that's what they use as a proxy for marketing investment. And you can see. What's happened since we last looked in 2005? Only 6% of them actually bothered to look at it then, and now it's 80%. 80% 80, 80 of the investment analysts in that 200 sample actually did analysis on the AMP of those organizations. So we can discuss what the reasons for that are, and I would suggest that the availability of data is one. I would say, also suggest that the potentially damagingly the the discussion about attribution um is probably another which we don't necessarily want but they are starting to look at this in a in a consistent way now what percentage do you, of the b2b analysts do you think um actually looked at amp do you think it's higher or lower or the same Lower. It is lower. Excuse me. What is A and P? Advertising promotion. 
advertising and promotion. advertising and promotion okay. sorry i should have said that yeah and that's what they call that's what they call marketing is they call it a and b it's a grocery store that's yeah <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay 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 um so yeah so um b2b 74% well, but not much that's not a significant difference i thought it would be much lower than this but in fact it's not so you know and in, in this b2b analyst group there are you know it's mining it's engineering it's oil companies it's lots lots of different companies but um, I was quite surprised that it was quite so high. How does it work for the B2B? Because many B2B companies just do not report advertising. Right? They don't have advertising. It's more an SGM age, capture purchase. So it's, it, it, selling, uh, it's, it's whatever they, they actually deliver. They don't, you know, they're not a lot of them do it, but the ones that do, they look at it. So. <laughs> It's, it's interesting what you're going and raising. It's like, hey, there's a terminology difference, but yeah. there's got to remember where this from. But they've been doing an analysis of earnings transcripts going back to, I think, 2012. And uh, the number of questions being asked around like marketing spend, advertising spend has been increasing steadily almost every single year. Yeah. Versus before, they would just want to know what was sales spend or R&D spend. So that scrutiny is being put forward, but I think to your point, not a lot of them are disclosing it in B2B, even though it's definitely there as a component. But, uh, and, as, and as you'll see, as you'll see later, they're wanting more and more. They're wanting more and more transparency. They're wanting more information. Yeah. Um, but you would need to fill a different category, right? Because, uh, yes, there'll be massively, yes, there will be differences in categories. Yeah, yeah, and some and some of them, we, you know, what what is the equivalent of promotion in the mining industry, for example? Well, you know, and and it may well be the cost of their sales block or whatever. You know, it could be it could be lots of different things. So, so okay, so they're looking at this. So, does it make any difference to how they feel about it? Well, it certainly seems to, because those who actually analyze AMP are much more likely to believe that it's an investment and it drives growth. So if you look at the difference here, the marketing expenditure is an investment that should be made more effective and it drives organic growth. Now, ideally, you'd want those to be like at 70 or 80 plus percent. It's still you know, only around half. So we've still got a long way to go in terms of engaging them in, 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 what, in, in the value of that. But it's, there, is still a, there is still a difference there. Um, a couple of other uh, data points on this perception of value. We actually asked them about participating in earnings calls. Now, assuming that, as you just said, the conversation about AMP is increasing, you know, those that actively participate in those calls are more likely to say, yes, we want to actually capitalize AMP spend. So this, you know, the engagement with the spend and the, and the discussion about the spend improves their perception of value. Those who analyze are much more likely to say that they believe it's very important to the analysis that they do. So we want to encourage this conversation. We really, really do. But what about the difference between advertising and promotion? Is there a difference between the two? So we ask them, do they think advertising is a cost for an investment? Do they think promotion is a cost an investment and actually only less than a quarter think of it as an operating cost the majority think of it as either a bit of both or as an investment now what is probably more most concerning in, in my view from here is that we clearly haven't done enough to make to help them to understand the difference between advertising and promotion because you know, they're still saying that, you know, over, over half or well over half, nearly you know, two thirds of the investors think promotion is at least partly an investment. When in fact, the majority of no, they don't know what the difference is. They just don't know what the difference is. And we haven't, and we haven't made any effort to actually tell them what the difference is. And if we want to try and encourage that perception of it being investment, we have to do that sort of, uh, that sort of education and that sort of communication job. 
So another, um, another uh, oh yes, before I go into that, I mean, ideally at the end of this, this, this process, if we go through a perfect process, we want all CEOs to say things like this. I don't see marketing as a cost. I see it as an investment. You know, we, we don't see it as a cost line to save money from. And what was brilliant about this quote was this came out the day we produced this report. It, it couldn't have been the most more perfect, perfect launch report. So, um, okay, so they, you know, they engage with it. They, they, they improves the perception of value, but what do they think it does? Uh, what's, what financial metrics does it actually affect? Well, we offered them this list here from sales margin share, cash flow, profit margin, sales price, share price of risk. And the top two were sales volume and profit margin. And um, what for me, one of the most concerning elements was actually the, the lack of relationship with sales price. Uh, and I want to talk a little bit about that. Um, but we also asked them which benefited most. And it was split really between sales volume um, and profit share. So the same order, but the the the, uh, the percentages are a lot different. And I and I really I am a bit concerned about that uh, about that price element. So if you look at the B2B analysts, what was quite interesting was that they were much less likely to say it uh, correlated most to or it affected most sales volume price. There was a significant difference between the B2B analysts and the B2C analysts, but they were quite similar um, on the other financial metrics. And we can, can speculate as to why that is. It could be because they believe the effect of, of sales uh, sales volume. And the, the sales force generally had a much more effect, have a greater effect of sales price. And we are specifically asking about advertising and brand communication. And I think that as a uh, uh, as a definition of AMP might have also had an effect here. But why is this issue of price uh, so important? Well, to my mind. It is important, particularly now in this volatile environment, because if you look at something like the McKinsey Global Study of CFOs, you know, they use price as a lever. Uh, it's one of the most important strategies for them, uh, particularly the CFOs. So to my mind, if we, if we do equate uh, and associate what we do in marketing and in advertising with price, it means we can improve the conversation that we have with CFOs. And if we can say that we're ability that we we can affect the price a lot more, um, then we um, uh, then we'll be able to have that more meaningful conversation. And it's certainly over the last certainly over the last two years in the inflationary period we've just been through. If you look at the the, the sales growth from certainly on the FMC, the FMCG companies like Pepsi and Coke and Danone uh, and Unilever and here P and G. They have declared that it is pricing that has driven their growth, even though the sales growth, sales performance and, and in terms of volume has actually declined. <clears throat> they have produced, and, so, and, and it was surprising to them that their prices held up that. And then if you look at the McKinsey, um, the, the, the McKinsey pricing study that they sure. did a few years ago now, when they took the, the typical economies of an S&P 1500 company, and they looked at the effect of a price, 1% price increase um, to those companies. And if you, if you look at the, what, what it does in terms of profit increase, a 1% price increase increases profit by 8%. But obviously, the reverse is true. A decrease in 1% has the opposite effect and brings it down um, by, by 8%. And, and these, you know, this, sort of, this, this sort of volatility and what it does to profit something that certainly in, in certain companies you know people like you know the, the, the sales organizations don't necessarily understand and they will you know they'll easily sort of drop a price by five percent and so don't worry we'll we'll increase the volume you know we'll, we'll easily increase the volume and we'll definitely bring that back don't have to worry about that at all in most markets that will never happen a price re reduction of even five percent means that they have to increase volumes by 18 to offset that. So it'll never, never happen. 
but but this sort of relationship between price and profit is um is something that we um that we don't look at if, but but now now in the uk it's quite a lot of companies that are now and, and organizations like the ipa that are looking at this in um in, in, in much much more closely and there's some new work done by ITV, which is one of the major, the major leading uh, commercial TV company in the UK. They've been doing some much more holistic work on the effects of advertising. And what they've done, um, is that this was a, uh, this was, let's say it's a soft drink, large soft drink sector. And they looked at what the short-term sales effect was, the sustained sales effect, and then the margin from price. This has never really been done before because they have, nobody's really looked at the price. Yep. We've done this in B2B because I have a really good... Oh, brilliant. Okay. I can add to this if you want. Okay, fantastic. Yeah. Fantastic. Because they, they, they got all the pricing um, analysis of the sector over a two-year period, and they put this into this, put this, into this model. And they have made, by the way, they've made this this completely um, transparent so anybody can look at this model and take it. And we're now taking, the, the IPA is helping them to then take this across about six or seven other categories, um, from cars to mobile phones to, uh, to laundry, to see what the impact of price has been. So of that total advertising return over a two-year period, the impact on price was about What's what's when they're using total advertising return? What's the measure here? Is it incremental revenue? Is it profit? It, okay, we're going straight to profit. profit. Right? Okay. Yeah. yeah. And and I think I think what I'm what I'm sort of trying to say here is really that we are as a, as an industry we are starting to look much much more holistically about the effect of advertising. And the compound nature of what it's delivering for organizations rather than just volume. And we've probably been focused too much on sort of growth and volume of units rather than value and uh, and cost. The total advertising return is just the extra spent money on advertising. It is the return, it is the it's the profitability of that particular campaign over a series of campaigns over a two years period. But I think in terms of the, the absolute definitions, I can certainly send you that report and then they can, you can look at the, the Yeah, I would want to understand that as well. It's like my reading right now is it's 100 turns into 337, so it's a 227% return. That's but is it in incremental, with incremental, or is it because all the, all the last dollar spent? Or, yes. <laughs> that is incremental, it's the time of highly effective because there's still much more to spend to achieve the profit of the level. My understanding is that it's about the advertising profitability, it's the overall profit from the advertising return. But, it, but what I'm okay, so it's a slice of the overall AMP. I think I believe it's much more than that. It, it's but, uh, the, yeah, I think it's the it's the relative margin of a brand that is advertising versus the brand that it is okay. after they want to. So it's yes. Not, not incremental. Okay. yes, it's absolutely not incremental. Yes. So now I want to talk about cutting, cutting price because the, uh, cutting um, marketing spend. So this is one of the one of the other reasons that we did the the work with the analysts was to find out about what they thought about that. So we asked them if a company talked about cutting marketing spend, how do you feel about that? And we offered we only offered them two options: positive cost cutting measure. Short-term fix, long-term implications. And despite the fact that they feel that advertising and marketing and marketing and brand is really, really important to them, that they look at it, they have a positive feeling about it, that it's really top in terms of their analysis, over half of them are still saying that it's a positive cost cutting. Mm -hmm. um, compared to the same question about R&D, it's less so. Now, obviously, when you think about R and D and where that where that's put in terms of accounting, some of that R and D can be put into um, uh, into into capex, not opex. So I'm I am wondering here 
whether this is because they perceive R&D as an investment for the future and therefore that is bad. Therefore, they don't want that. Whereas marketing is still perceived as a cost. It's still perceived as, you know, it is, it is in that cost back, is in, in, that, in that cost. So, and it, it's not really that surprising because it is still perceived to be a discretionary spend. This is a, the, Delo the Deloitte CFO <clears> study. And it, and it measures the discretionary spend that is expected to rise over the next 12 months. And obviously, you know, discretionary spend is always lower than you know, people and capex, apart from post-COVID, when it all rose up together. So whilst the marketing spend is, is still perceived to be discretionary in that, in that bucket, it's not going to have um, uh, the, same, the same element of it. <laughs> Just laughing. I, I presented last year, Matt, the, from a B2B example, the short term effect of cutting marketing was increased profitability for nine months yeah. at the cost of four times, four and a half times higher cumulative losses over five years. I've got a chart coming up on similar, similar, similar to that. Yeah, it's, just, it's the obsession with CapEx, thinking that CapEx provides a return because yeah. accounting amortizes CapEx mm -hmm. over five, ten, yes. or twenty five years. Yes. Uh, so you naturally think the marketing return is only for a year, because yes. you're only allowed to recognize it within a fiscal period. And some of it's now allowed to amortize over 10 years. So that's actually even, you know, that makes it even, you know, even greater. Mm -hmm. So finally, one of the biggest questions was, what do you think about the idea of putting marketing um, into CapEx? What support do we have for that? We have huge support for that. 90%, if I think 89% agreed, yes, or at least sometimes, but over half said, yes, they actually do um, support that as an idea. But that, you know, that's great, but what effect would that have? And we asked them, what, you know, so what would happen if we do that? And we gave them a few suggestions. And again, you know, have better information to value the company, 59% agree with that, over half say, and have a better understanding about the growth potential of that company. Now, I personally was a bit disappointed in, the, in, the, in these figures. I wanted them to be even greater, but until we get that relationship between value and, it, and the, the investment and the growth and the value of that money, um, then you know, we're, not going to, we're not going to see 70s and 80s here. But only in about nearly half said they would invest more. I'm not sure that's necessarily true. 33 percent they would said they 34 percent said they would uh, be less likely, less likely to cut it. But you know, what, what does all this demonstrate? What does all this show that we have to do with these people? It certainly feels to me like we, we have to improve the narrative. We have to certainly get more information about what what we do and what the value of that to those organizations. And I think one of them, which was, which was to your point earlier, about this compound nature of advertising and marketing. And, and Ian Whitaker, who is the former analyst that helped write the report with us, suggested this, which was the concept of this compound thinking. And that what a lot of people, and I certainly suggest some of the analysts as well, Assume that advertising won't like this. It's all sort of plus, you know, just four, you know, four lots, plus equals 16. But actually, it's much more holistic. And it actually has a compound effect. What that also means is that if you cut it a bit, right, and you reduce that four to 3.5, then you think that you're reducing your impact by 5%. But because of the compound nature of what advertising does, you're reducing it actually for my 25%. And it goes back to the conversation we were having before lunch about you know, the things that it affects, the distribution, the improvement of the, uh, in, you know, increase into, into other categories, you know, the bringing, in, bringing in new customers that will try new products, and all of those things that don't necessarily, aren't necessarily measured in that way. I mean, another example is uh, another element on um, the longevity of the effect. It's still perceived that the activity, results of those activities will be in one year. And we know that that's not true. And Thinkbox, which is like the equivalent of uh, the VAB here, um, released this study literally about two or three months ago. It's 
called the Prophet's Ability 2. Compared to Prophet's Ability 1, which was about three years ago. See what they said? Prophet's Ability. Really good. Really fantastic marketing. Um, but what they've done is that they have um, analysed the speed of the payback over a period of time. And they've obviously done it by channel. And this is a this is a this is a chart straight from their presentation. And obviously it's, it's shown the effects of television over time. And you sort of expect that. But but for me, one of the things that is really interesting about the way that they are talking about this is they're not talking about long than short, but they're talking about the relative impact over time and the speed of the payback. You will get paid back over a certain amount of time. And also the way that they're talking about immediate payback, carryover payback, and sustained payback. And it's the language that they are using to describe the return that I think is one of the most interesting things. And in terms of time, just so that we know, so uh, immediate payback is 13 weeks. Sustained payback, which is that middle, that sort of uh, the pale of blue, is, uh, sorry, sorry, immediate payback is within a week. The pale of blue is 13 weeks, and sustained is over, is over a two-year period. And I think this terminology is something that we can, you know, our, our, the way that we describe the accountability is something that we can really, really improve. And, and, and really, these sorts of things demonstrate that, it's, you know, that marketing is a strategic investment that we have to think about over a long period of time. It is not a cost to be managed now. Uh, what I've hopefully demonstrated is that, yes, we still need to make the argument. We still need to make the argument that marketing is more an investment than a cost. That financial community that we talk to, those, those investment analysts, overwhelmingly feel the same, that, that, or feel the same as us, that, that it should be much more of a uh, seem to be into CapEx rather than OPEX. Uh, OPEX and they really do um, feel that it's... Um, it's very, very important to the growth of the companies. And, and, and once you engage the, uh, that audience with what it does, then they imp their, their perception of what it does improves even more. Yes. Do you have any, have any data on the attitudes of CFOs um, as compared to such a similar, similar questions? Yes, but not here. No, I, I, I <laughs> I'll, I'll take your word if you tell us. <laughs> I'll take your word for the conclusion. Well, to a point, and I, that's, that's a beautiful segue yeah. because I actually produced this book, <laughs> which was called um, "Marketing to the CFO," uh, and it, it, it's um, and I, I could and this this is the, I did it for the B two B Institute uh, for LinkedIn about two three years ago, and it's just it's freely available to everybody, and it, it was a it was a study of global CFOs and and how they perceived how they perceived marketing and but also how marketers needed to talk to them, how they needed to change their language, how they needed to shift the way that they were positioning what they were um, uh, how they were expressing themselves, how they run meetings. You know, it was it was sort of quite detailed it's quite detailed in that respect. Um, but um but just but just finishing off with this um it is, it is very clear that there's much more scrutiny in this area, uh, and they are looking for more information. And, and actually, that should be welcomed, because these guys don't have very much time. And if, if, you know, by talking to some of them, the fact that they want more information than they really, you know, really do, that should be welcomed by us, and we should give them that. And so that's one of the reasons that that the IPA decided to do this is to encourage the marketing department to engage more with the boards, the boards for them to engage with the investment companies. So, you know, yes, it's 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 two or three steps removed, but it it helps to create a, a, a hopefully a desire for that board to have that conversation with that board. Yeah. Um, I was just reading the CMO survey, which gets launched by Deloitte, and I think. Yeah. Uh, university. One of the, and I don't remember the number, but I remember it was striking. And the number of CMOs that are invited to board meetings and also meetings with analysts is very, very low. Yeah. Yet 
the demand here seems yeah. very high. Yeah. Um, yeah. Can you comment on any? Yeah, I have a number. Say, I think it's about four percent. Yeah, it was extremely. Excuse me. I don't yeah. know if it was four, but it was, it was something like that. Yeah. Yeah. But it's but you know if you think about the number of CMOs that are on board, Five it's really low. It's really really low. Um, but it you know it it feels that yes there is a demand, there is a demand for that. Group. Are they not asking? Because if, if, if yeah. the marketing questions are being asked by analysts, yeah. then of course at some point there would be a demand for the CMO to be okay. in that meeting. Can I yeah. build on that? Where yes. were these 200 that you interviewed? Or There's 100 there? in the US, 100 in the UK. So it's been like 50 B2C US, 50 B2C No, no, it wasn't as a quick, no. There was oh, a smaller okay, so number of B2C. Okay, but it, so it was American analysts as well. Oh, yeah. So, oh, yeah. And like that should be like printed and just whacked off Wall Street across yeah. every single analyst walking by because yeah. they're saying it, but they're sure as heck not behaving this way. No. So can, I, can I posit a theory? And I've, I've done this with being in analytics, you know, which has been bulk of my career. You, there is a desire for information. Once that information is in your hands, oftentimes people don't know what to do, right? So I'd love to see the marketing spec, but do they have the tools to analyze right. the impact? And also let's face facts, like yeah. execution is so, it's so squishy, right? Yeah, yeah. I well, could give somebody a million dollars and somebody else a million dollars and have two different results depending on the marketing. Well, one of the, one of the sort of projects that we wanted to build this on and we haven't done it yet was actually create a top 10 questions that you as an analyst should be asking these companies or your, your companies that you analyze. And these are the sorts of questions, these are the sorts of answers that you should be getting back just to help them to, you know, to direct that to that conversation. But, you know, you, if, you, if you look at um, the transcripts of, of um, brands like Diageo, they have very, very specific questions like, why are you not spending more in, on Johnny Walker in South America? Mm -hmm. And partly, I think that's because they have had those conversations in the past. So, you know, they know what Di how Diageo work with marketing. And in, the, in, in their um, investor um, meetings, the big investor meetings that Diageo do, they bring the CMO out. They bring the CMO, CMO out to, um, to do huge presentations. They have their massive um, database, which they show. Um, based on several interviews I've done, I, the answer to your question is the CMO can't answer the question that's being asked. They want the information the CMO has built. In fact, a couple of CMOs have told me we would be embarrassed by the CMO being present to try to answer those questions. Yes. The training, it's a training issue in it's how to interact with analysts. Yeah. I, I would agree. The other piece that I'd add to that from my experience of being in front of boards with CMOs, uh, it's obfuscation. Mm -hmm. There's like the, 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 you, to, to the types of data that you're disclosing here from the company level is several hierarchies lower than the conversations that are had at the board level. And at the analyst level, there's very few analyst firms. They're usually self-funded on their research that can go and ask a Johnny Walker in South America yeah. question, right? They're mostly staying very top line. They're looking at common terms yeah. across multiple companies, the same sector, and they're making a lot of leaps of faith in analysis and assumptions. A lot of the CMOs work. You can't aggregate to the top. Like our whole conversation about mm -hmm. brand preference. Like if you just started reporting on brand preference, you're going to go and have people completely misunderstand yeah. how the company's doing because you don't know if the components are yeah. different by yeah. industry. Yeah. Even though as a signal, it's the same, the components are not. And I think that's the disconnect that's here. It's the same problem that's there with, is between CFOs and CMOs is that CFOs don't understand the mechanics of marketing execution because everything has some kind of timeline in marketing. Right, like you just went and showed, right? Yeah. Short term, medium term, yeah. term long term effects yeah. of, of marketing by different mediums. That's not a that's not a finance no. conversation, no. right? It's no. capital allocation yeah. and a target return period, which is usually artificial, three months, twelve months, five years, 
right? Like that's the timelines that they're looking at, but it's, it's a very organic uh, uh, practice by the marketer and everybody's putting in a, a tremendous put a, a, put a round peg in a square hole. And this is, I think the disconnect is the point of the day. Yeah. Oh, we're going to have to yes wrap up but thank you thank you so much thank you